this big picture is part of a, an official album of pictures that was produced for the Asheho Beet Sugar Factory. Asheho, or Asheke, as we say in Russian, is the name of a town in the name of a river. And the location is something like 40 miles from Harbin. This factory was built actually quite a long time ago, even for the period that we're talking about here. It uh, had been built in about 1910 by some Poles who were in Manchuria. Poles coming from what then was the Russian-occupied part of Poland. Those Poles, at least so uh, legend has it, found themselves in Manchuria as a result of uh, the 1904-05 Russo-Japanese War. Somehow they were either in the Russian army or with the Russian army or doing business with the Russian army or whatever. Uh, the important thing to note is that at that time, and even to some extent to our very day, Poland was and is a, a major beet sugar producing country. It's a very major industry in Poland, and at that time was relatively more important before heavy industry started coming to Poland. Lots of the equipment for sugar factories and uh, supplies and so on used to be produced in Poland. There were lots and lots of people there well acquainted with the industry and its, its technology, its skills. So there was a group of Poles that formed a company around 1910 and built this factory, bringing much of the equipment, as I said, from Poland, or maybe some from other places. And it operated for some time until it went bankrupt. By that time, I think there were new owners. It went bankrupt sometime in the late 1920s, I think. It went into the ownership of the National City Bank of New York, which apparently foreclosed on it uh, as a consequence of the note it had. There was a branch of the National City Bank in Herbin, um, one of the few foreign or foreign non-Asian banks in Herbin. And at a certain point, early in the 1930s, Uncle Lova, that is Lou Zickman, who until that time was heavily in the sugar business, but by way of importing, decided to buy it. He probably bought it at a good price, since the, there probably was hardly any other buyer <laughs> for it, <laughs> and they put it back into operation. He brought Polish technicians from Poland. He uh, invited back the person whom he appointed as the superintendent of the factory, who had been with us, this factory before, and uh, a high proportion of the technical and leading personnel in this case, in this establishment, was Polish, as a matter of fact. He knew pan on that? Yeah, and uh, uh, here's somebody connects. with a with a hat and a cane. Well, that could be Lova. So Uncle Lova uh, bought this factory, and in one respect, he got a big surprise, because uh, very soon after he bought it, the Japanese invaded Manchuria, militarily. Mm -hmm. They held the railroad and the port cities and so on in southern Manchuria as uh, their trophy of the Russo-Japanese War. But then uh, they decided to grab all of Manchuria. And on September 18th, 1931, they instigated what is known as the Mukden Incident, Mukden being a major city in Manchuria, where they claim their trains were shot at by some Chinese troops, and so they had to take drastic action, and the drastic action was taking over all of Manchuria which they did, and they reached Harbin in their military advance in February 32. So I watched the Japanese troops walk in to my city. The Chinese, of course, were very poorly equipped, and in fact, although by 1932, the authority of the central government, the Chankashek government, was already more or less established in Manchuria, there still was a lot of warlord's power, and that which complicated the whole situation. Well, the arrival of the Japanese, and their taking over Manchuria and creating the puppet state of Manchukuo, had very definite consequences for this factory. 
uh, although they could have been much more drastic. Namely, the Japanese put considerable pressure for my uncle to take in a Japanese sugar trading family firm as partners. And this happened. And the result was the creation in 1934 of something called the North Manchurian Sugar Industrial Company. However, my uncle and my father and my other uncle, Misha's father, held a very large part of the shares. Indeed, my uncle held a larger part of the shares and he remained as the, what we would call now, the CEO and my father remained also. Actually, the relationship with this Japanese sugar firm were quite normal. I mean, sure, they got a part of the shares, whether they brought any capital in, I'm not sure. But the relations on the whole were pretty good. And they used to come and uh, you know, visit and so on. This is a stock certificate for five shares of stock of the North Maturian Sugar Industrial Company, otherwise known in Japanese as Hokuman Seito Kabushiki Kaisha. <laughs> What we see now is not the sugar factory itself, but a uh, subsidiary factory, as it were, an alcohol factory, which is very common with all sugar factories. What happens is that as the sugar is extracted from the beet, it's extracted into a liquid which contains the juice of the beet, which in turn contains a very high proportion of sugar. Then, by a series of chemical and physical processes, the sugar is extracted from that liquid, then uh, turned either into granulated sugar or cube sugar or something like that. But when it is extracted from that liquid, not all of the sugar in that liquid is in fact extracted. Some remains in it. And that liquid is sent to a distillery for fermentation, in other words, for making alcohol out of the sugar still remaining in the liquid. And that way one gets full use of the beet juice. Now the beets incidentally are not red, uh, they are white and much larger than our red beets. Not too bad to the taste. Really? Mm, you sweet. can taste them raw? Uh, or do yeah, you, you can them? eat them raw, yeah, very sweet. Are they, are they generally eaten? I, I'm sure they're generally eaten, but all but the, the tiniest proportion goes into manufacturing because sugar beets are grown uh, in such a tremendous amount. Yep. Those two houses uh, were apartment houses for what we called European personnel. And th that was, of course, uh, more skilled personnel, technical personnel, and, you know, accountants and people like that. And, but that last building, of which you see only a portion over on the right, uh, that, if I remember correctly, was the office building where the uh, offices uh, um, were located. So did your, your father and Lyova all uh, traveled out there every day, no, or did you have no, an office in No, no, in no. this is office just on the spot, but you the headquarters of the corporation was, uh, <coughs> was in Harbin, right. which was not a very large office. That we this is a shot of the sugar factory, not the distillery, the sugar factory from another angle. The sugar factory burned coal. Uh, which also operated an electric power station you, and it provided electricity. Now what you see here are the sugar beets. They are collected in large heaps, thousands and thousands of tons of them. You see, at least in moderate climates, where sugar beet is usually grown, the uh, beet matures sometimes in September or so. Then it is uh, carted or otherwise uh, transported to the sugar factory and piled up. The um, Russians have a special name for the big yard where uh, the sugar beets are piled up. Here they are being transported by Chinese peasant carts. You see the small Chinese horses and mm -hmm. the two-wheeled carts. Mm -hmm. What would happen was that the sugar mill would contract with each peasant to produce a certain amount of sugar. And in order to uh, give an incentive to do it properly, he would be paid not by weight of the beet, but by sugar content. Because he have, would have considerable control over sugar content according to the way he cultivated the sugar. How do they measure sugar? Ah, that's what I'm coming to. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, well, first of all, of course, one had to determine uh, the weight of the beads. So as, these, as the peasants came up with their carts, and I think later on we'll see that done, they came to a weighing station. The full cart would be weighed, then they would come here, drop their beads, and return with an empty cart, and the empty cart would be weighed. Uh -huh. yeah. And the difference, obviously, was almost, not entirely, but almost the sugar beet. Yeah. And then, from every cart, there would be a sample drawn, and it went directly to uh, the laboratory there. They, the peasants had to wait for the analysis, and in that laboratory, by some very, fairly simple means, I assume, they determined the sugar content. Hmm. And then they calculated how much, uh, in terms of sugar content, he brought, and that is uh, the basis of his payment. Wow. But this is standard. This is how it used to be done in Russia. This is how it used to be done in Poland, still then, and in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure also by Spreckles in the Salinas Valley in California, mm -hmm. obviously. The only deviation from this practice was introduced by the Soviets. Not because it was rational, but because for all kinds of reasons they couldn't carry it off, and they paid just by the weight of the sugar beet, which meant was <laughs> that they used to get a as dirty sugar beet as the peasant could possibly load, yeah. <laughs> all the mud, right. and secondly, since the peasants wouldn't take any take care of cultivating wheat, very low sugar content. content. <laughs> <laughs> and the Soviets still do that. The Russians still really? do that. They ha still haven't turned it. And every year they write article after article saying they should really turn to the other method, but they never do. <laughs> that is one of the many, many aspects of the inefficiency of the Soviet economy. What was the season for bringing these Winter beans time. in? Winter time. Uh, what is more, the season for manufacturing sugar is fairly short, usually about four months from September to through January or something, because if the beet lies around long enough, it loses a lot of sugar content. And the rest of the time, of course, many of the local people are laid off, the local, many of the local people are local peasants anyway. And they laid off for that to do their agriculture work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is actually here River which fed water. Sugar beet processing is very, very water intensive. It takes a lot of water you know, to wash all the juice out mm. of the After all, you have thousands, many thousands of tons of uh, beets. So a dam is built to dam up the water. The water is diverted and so on. But it was very nice to have the river there because one could go boating and swimming and so on. I believe this was the workshop for the repair of whatever had to be repaired, and for the uh, production of spare parts. Uh, uh, since uh, Manchuria was very far away from the centers of uh, equipment and spare part manufacturing, and there was no, at that time, communication by air, so you couldn't quickly order a part, only too often it had to be repaired or manufactured on the spot. So there was a considerable number of machine tools and people uh, doing just that. I used to have a lot of fun walking through and uh, watching them manufacture these things. Uh, this is what for fuel, I think some coal was also used, but I'm mistaken. However, Manchuria, especially not Manchuria, is a highly wooded country, so it was not very difficult to, to get firewood. This is just another view of the factory and of the distillery in the back, the one with the smaller plume of smoke. This is the main entrance uh, to the factory, with the rails for going in, and the, somewhere we'll probably see it soon, the road also going in. This was the main horse carriage. This is what would go out to the ra railway station a couple of miles away to pick up the boss, the superintendent, or my father, or somebody. And when I came, I had a lot of fun sitting on the coachman's seat <laughs> and sort of pretending I'm, I'm driving the uh, the horses. What would your age have been? Then? Nine until uh, about, well, until the very time I left, uh, when I left at the age of 17. Now, because the river had tendency uh, to overflowing, uh, there were levees around this place, and this is one of those levees. The levees were very nicely planted by bushes and trees and made a very fine uh, walk around the whole territory. That's water we see on the left side? That's the river, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, now here are the peasant carts coming in or going out. I can't see whether they're empty or not. And here, the, uh, this is the weighing station I spoke uh -huh. about. Right. Not too different from the weighing stations along our highways now. This is again the main entrance. Now, you see these uh, buildings built somewhat like fortresses <laughs> with <laughs> turrets yes. and embrasures and so on. Well, in a moment you'll see why. This was the, what we call, director of superintendents, this Polish engineer's house. You see how large it is, built yep. like a country manor, very sturdy. Birch trees here, but on the other side, a very beautiful garden. Another byproduct of uh, beet sugar manufacture is uh, beet pulp. After the, you see the beets are sliced, sort of like noodles, and after the juice had been leached out of them, mm -hmm. the pulp then is waste. It is carried away from the plant, and there are huge piles of pulp. Usually, this pulp is not wasted, but is uh, sold to local peasants because it makes excellent. Father. Feed for uh, or no, fodder no, for cattle. Oh, yes. However, Chinese peasants don't keep much cattle, certainly not much milk cattle. They keep horses. I don't know whether horses used to eat it. And what the factory finally did is establish its own farm. So it became also a not so much a dairy as a meat ranch, if you wish, because it all had essentially free, free food, free, free yeah. fodder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these were the barracks for the Chinese workers who essentially were local peasants who for several months would work as workers here, you, mm -hmm. mostly in an unskilled way, but some semi-skilled way, or, you know, with the years they would learn certain things, and then they would go home after the four months or so. All right, now here you see something that looks really like a battlement. Yes, it does. Unfortunately, Manchuria, since times of memorial, used to contain a, a lot of bandit formations, and obviously a place like this would be a great attraction for them. Yeah. So the factory was at the same time a bit of a fortified, a militarized unit. There was an armed unit guarding it, about 25 people, all Russians. No kidding. Yeah, Russians for two reasons. First of all, nearly all of them had, had experience in the Civil War and so on in the First World War. Uh, secondly, Russians had the reputation at that time to be much better fighters than the Chinese, and the Chinese uh, would think twice engaging them in a, in a fight. Mm -hmm. uh, and were they also uh, more trusted than Chinese would be? And they would be more trusted, one could communicate with them, but also they would be less likely to collude with the bands or anything like that. Uh -huh. So there were about 25 of them, and I think there were at any one time probably about 8 or 10 all around the perimeter of the factory in uh, reinforced or otherwise fortified places, mostly with plain rifles, but I think they had a couple of machine guns too. Jeez. Uh, uh, and that's a guardhouse, I think, by the gate. Uh, well, it's a guardhouse by the gate, yeah. Mm. This is where the carts are coming in. Were they the actual gate. army personnel, or were they just... Well, they didn't belong at that time to any army. They were just okay, they were privately, hired privately hired, yeah. Okay. And they are commanded by a, a Russian officer. That, that is, a, that one, is of a, one of the guards. He's one of them, yeah. Well, this is the dam here, and this is uh, the flume which takes in the water into the factory. Mm -hmm. This is where the, 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 the levee, or...? This uh, is no, the, this, no, is this is a, the dam. This is a so weir, yeah, oh. a dam, a crudely made dam. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, however, is the main office in Harbin. So you see North Manchurian Sugar Industrial Company, and in Russian, Severo Manchurska Sakhna Krishna, and here in Chinese, mm -hmm. and, and here probably in Japanese, and so on. It was not a very large, it was just essentially two storefronts, these two storefronts, not upstairs, upstairs were restaurants and whatnot. So as I say, probably about ten people who worked there. My father, Smish's father, and some typists. And also one armed guard, he was like this, uh, <laughs> very muscular, carried a large caliber revolver, and my parents always wondered whether he'd be the first one to hold up the place. <laughs> <laughs> my mother and I here standing on steps, these are the steps to the house or home of the superintendent of the factory, this Polish gentleman.
It was a very large house, and whenever we came down, uh, we stopped there where there were oh, lots and lots of bedrooms there and so on, so there lots of room for visitors. Mm. So did you actually live near, you, you lived in Harbin, you didn't live near the factory, right? No, but as I said, we used to come in the summer, yeah. sometimes in the winter too. Uh, this was the Polish man who was the superintendent. He used to be working in the factory way back in the early 20s, and Uncle Ljubo bought the factory in the early 30s. He brought him back from Poland. This lady here was the wife of the superintendent of the factory, and uh, this lady was also the wife of the chief engineer and so mm -hmm. on, yeah, and my mother. mother. Well, these pictures are all taken at or near the sugar factory, which I think I told you was about 40 miles away from Herbin. But it also served as a kind of summer place for us. And you may recall I spoke to you about this young woman whom later, some 60 years later, I uh, saw in Washington. I last saw her as a young girl, when I was 19 or 20, oh, and yes, then a right. woman of about 70. What was her name? Adele. And here we have my father, Grisha, Paula, my mother, myself. So this is a Japanese raincoat. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Oh. Made of straw. And, yeah. and, and the person, Uncle Leopold. 